Uh, so hi again, let me try it again. Hi again, uh, welcome to the day two and uh, stellometry. I'm Artyom Shela. Uh, today, uh, the whole day will be about stellometry, me and Joana Bishuk and uh, Jose uh, Manuel Fradejas, uh, Professor Jose Manuel Fradejas will be uh, teaching you different things about stellometry. Uh, sorry, I put only my name here uh, because the first uh, the first lecture is uh, is on me. Um, so uh, hi once again, hi Zoom chat. Uh, we don't forget, we didn't forget about you. Hello everyone there as well. Uh, and so let's jump uh, jump in. Uh, so today uh, we'll be talking uh, about the basics of uh, stellometry, and I hope by the end of the day, or even maybe by the end of this lecture, this weird question uh, weird question here would be uh, less bizarre. Uh, right, answering this question uh, would require uh, us uh, defining uh, and designing our own spaces. We talked about spaces uh, that we can inhabit by different texts uh, using different features, different approach to that uh, already before. So uh, Javier uh, yesterday talked about the word embeddings and different other representation methods that can, you know, define the space where you put your texts and then look at the similarities. Uh, in their relationships or difference in, in their relationship, right? And uh, here I want to go back to the name of the school and uh, do a little like uh, comment on that because it's uh, it's called mining uh, or digging for for knowledge, right? Extracting knowledge from texts. And stylometry is not really about you know direct extraction of knowledge. It's much more about extraction of knowledge from the relationship between texts. And as we will see, there is a lot of information to get from. You know, from the relationships uh, of the text on this imagined abstract Manhattan map, and we will talk about why Manhattan is here. It's not. Uh, it's not just a whim. Um, so, uh, let's continue. So, stylometry itself, the word stylometry, it's quite old-fashioned, uh, right? It was proposed by uh, Polish, uh, the philosopher of Polish origin, Vincenzi Lutoslawski, in the eighth of the, uh, in the uh, end of the nineteenth century, and it called it a method of measuring stylistic affinities or stylistic uh, similarities. And generally, this um, definition holds to this day. But I want to uh, like stress that nowadays, a stylometry kind of resurfaced uh, back as a, as a term in uh, in the wake of computational approaches to texts, uh, when a humanist started to use big, uh, big old mainframe computers in 70s uh, and 80s. Um, and so we still use it kind of traditionally. And um, I want to stress that thinking about stylometry only as a method is a bit uh, limiting, because we will, we, we will see that there is much more, uh, much more to stylometry than, than just measuring things. Right, it's all about understanding the variation between uh, texts. What drives the var variation? Which features drives the difference? So, in many ways, it is uh, adjacent to linguistics and language variation studies. Uh, so, uh, I like to think about the stylometry as a like a subfield of computational uh, uh, computational text analysis that studies generally the differences or measuring uh, the measured differences and similarities. Uh, between uh, between the texts and and you will see we will do very simple things today we will do like uh, uh, you know, what Javier uh, called bag of words models we will do counting texts uh, counting words in texts and we will see how um, actually much uh, complicated uh, complicated organized information sits there right and so. I hope that this class would be a good introdu introduction, not just to stylometry, but also generally to multivariate think, uh, multivariate text analysis using many features simultaneously to understand uh, uh, to understand the relationship between the texts and the forces that drive this relationship. So there is really no like it. It, it is not like a, some a, some very specific. Uh, you know, a very specific corner where only a bunch of weird people hang out. This is different. That, that generally opens doors to a lot of to, to doing to to do think a lot a lot of things with text. Okay. Uh, so, funny thing uh, is that there is uh, uh, an older technical term, stylometry, which refers to the art of measuring the columns. This this kind of columns, right? So, uh, it's my common joke. So, if you if you're here for this kind of stylometry, I'm sorry to disappoint you. We will not do measuring columns. However. Uh, you know, I also need to think like when I think about that, a lot of stylometry, um, you know, the, the proper sort of the text analysis stylometry is about in one way measuring columns in tables. So maybe that's exactly what we are going to do today is measuring the columns. Um, so uh, uh, 
the question here, the main question here becomes like what, uh, how these differences between texts, I said that Islamometry works with differences, how these differences uh, are expressed uh, and divide, uh, defined. And they, uh, of course, can be defined in many, many ways. Uh, so this is the main question of uh, the text, how we represent the text, or in other words, the model of the text. And as you know, all the models are wrong, uh, but some are uh, very useful. And this is the case for, for text representation. If you think about this column, right, it has some useful qualities to that that we can measure to speak about its like physical uh, dimensions, right? There's height, and there's width uh, to it. Uh, we can also, you know, think we can add another measurements to this column. For example, how many times Artyom Shela detached this column? This could be a legit measurement, right? But there's many, many, probably not that many contexts where this measurement is useful. And the thing about the text is that, you know, there is no good intuitive uh, measure of what is useful for ca uh, for capturing or for, uh, you know, defining the text. There's many, many things that happen in the text, and we can represent it in in different. Uh, 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 in different ways, right? Uh, so uh, during the previous day, there was already, uh, you know, um, several ways to do uh, uh, to do that te te textual modeling or textual representation was uh, mentioned, right? We can use the word frequencies, we can use uh, the topics that we also algorithmically infirm. Uh, we can do if you have your spacey model, we can represent the text just with a uh, part of speech text, right? Just a sequence of the part of speech and work with that. Or if we want to access to the syntax, we can combine parts of speech together into the so-called engrams, right? And, and you will have some understanding of which part of speech follow uh, another, and we can count this and represent like uh, texts in this way, right? We can have all kinds of other uh, uh, other features that represent some structural properties of text, for example, like uh, the shape of networks of character connections and features of these networks. There's also a way to, to formalize it and calculate it. So there's a lot of ways. Right, uh, the embeddings is a very popular way to represent text, and also the sentiment scores you can derive like sentiment scores from uh, uh, from words from the lexis in text, and then run with that. So there's a lot of ways, and there is no like one you know single uh, right way to do that. It it really depends on the on the research question uh, and your approach uh, to the text. So let's get uh, back to the simplest uh, to the very simple thing. Uh, counting words, right? Uh, this is the model of the text that is called the bag of words. So here is the first paragraph of one of the Sherlock Holmes stories, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, who was usually very late. What we do, um, as you heard today, uh, previously as well, is we, uh, you know, we uh, don't care about the order of the words here. We don't care in which direction words flow. We just basically go over the text with like your Python iterator that you learned yesterday, and we count the words, right? And then we maybe arrange them in their frequency uh, uh, in their frequency order, right? And this, this is what you get. Uh, uh, obviously, not uh, many like uh, words are here that are related to the content of this text, right? This is the major feature of uh, any uh, 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 any natural language text is that uh, the frequency will be the most frequent words would be the function words, the syntactic glue of texts. You will always get that. And you also see that the frequency of these words will drop very, very quickly. But this is a small text, of course. Um, uh, usually, we don't do stylometry on a, a text this uh, this small, but you know it's also possible. So, anyways, maybe much, much more familiar to you would be this kind of a representation of the uh, of this text, right? So now uh, we derived a set of numbers for uh, this text. We can we can write it like the Doyle, um, Hound of Baskerville, the paragraph one is equal um, to a set of numbers, right? Uh, you, you should know how the set of numbers is called, how we call it. Vector, yes. Uh, this is what is called vector, or a mathematician would probably also say that this is ordered set of numbers. Why it's ordered set of numbers? Because uh, the order does matter here, right? The first position, we know this, the first position of, uh, uh, of this number, the number 10, is related to the V. And if we add another paragraph, uh, you know, another text, another document to our measurement, our first column would be the frequencies of word V always, right? So, so this is very useful because, you know, we do uh, all kinds of linear operations on the, uh, on the columns, right? And we always are sure that we are comparing similar features to similar features, right? And if there is, for example, a text where there is zero word V, but for example, it's not an English text and we add it for some reason here, you know, we'll just have a zero. 
uh, it's not really, you know, uh, it's not really similar to, to, the, to the example with a column, right? Because the column with a zero height would probably have a zero, um, uh, zero width as well, and it will be, it will be a virtual column. But for, for text analysis, a zero, zeros is generally not a problem. I mean, generally zeros are a problem uh, for, for, for multivariate analysis, but it, it, it handles zeros just as, uh, just as any, any other number, right? It's just we didn't record any observation of, of a word in this context. Okay, so let's uh, for a minute. Uh, this might sound like not very, uh, you know, not very insightful, right? So this, uh, let's for for a moment play a game with you, and let's put our, ourselves in the shoes of a bag of words, or let's put ourselves in a bag in a way, right? So this uh, word cloud is just it's not uh, unfiltered word cloud, so uh, it represents the most frequent words, but the function words are filtered, and some of the names are filtered, not not all of them, right? Uh, so you presumably don't know what the text is, right? But you see the most frequent words here. And most frequent words already give us a lot of information about it, right? So maybe you, some of you even like know from what, uh, uh, from what text these words are coming from, right? Or at least you have some intuition what kind of text it is. Is it fiction? Probably fiction, right? There's uh, words uh, sea and shadow and power and dark and spell as well. So maybe some fantasy fiction, right? And then we can, uh, you know, uh, using our previous knowledge, we can um, uh, uh, we can infer some more information about that as well, right? Uh, because if there is a sea and boat and magic, there is already the circle of this, uh, uh, the circle of uh, of the candidates uh, is uh, smaller. So any guesses what the novel could be? Yes, a wizard of the RC, uh, five points to the Gryffindor. <laughs> Uh, that's that's exactly that, right? And of course, uh, you know, it's it is giving a lot of information, and it will be different from a similar novel or like the uh, the other novel that is also written about the sea. This is again should be quite easy uh, easy an example. There's also a sea, but there is also a whale, right? And there is also a white whale. Uh, so obviously, the uh, the candidates are uh, even smaller than that, and we use our previous knowledge to understand that this is uh, coming from Melville's Moby Dick. Right, and so the last example again, something very similar, also a fiction, but this time not about the sea. And we immediately like recognize this. And and some of this, this is um, a, a little bit more tricky. But you have the androids, bounty and police. Any guesses? Well, yes, the androids was the and there's a police and a bounty and the you know, the detective story about uh, about the androids yes this is philip k dick uh, so you see uh, we did quite well even if we had like very silly stupid information about the text right and this is what generally happens under the hood in the back of words representation and there's a lot of things happen so uh it's useful to think about all these kind of operations not only about the uh, back of words but also word vectors and embeddings and whatever as a proxies right uh, and the word frequencies can serve as a proxy uh, to things that we care about in text and this is uh, uh this is not always like that right you cannot put too much too much trust into the word frequencies but often it is um uh right and um uh, so the word frequencies, if you think about the word frequencies, what they represent, they, they represent the word choice. And the word choice is a result of social and cultural conditions under which this text was produced, the culture, uh, the genre, uh, social conventions, time, even style and fashion. They're all, uh, they all have their hands in organizing the, uh, or organizing the word frequencies. And as we will see later, there is no single like way to, to answer like what what frequencies represent. They represent a lot. There's huge inf amount of information in them. This could be a curse and a blessing in itself. So uh, uh, when, I, when I think about, uh, you know, text analysis, I like to think, or, or when, I, when I teach text analysis, I like to think about it as a collection of well, a lot of uh, amazing, like, dice the, uh, on different color, right? The dice that you play, uh, you know, at D&D or some other games. Uh, um, yeah, whatever. So we have, like, a lot of those small, small cubes, right? They're all different colors. When you toss it, like, imagine we're tossing this huge pile of, uh, pile of cubes into the, some abstract space, you know, if this uh, if this a normal fair die, they were probably you know roll all around. The colors would be randomly uh, distributed, and nothing like interesting uh, uh, except like some 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 basic you know uh, uh, chaotic randomness would not happen with them, right? However, if we do that with text and imagine that is the each text is like 
is a complex die, right? So it has many dimensions, many words that represent uh, this text. You will probably get something like that on the plot here. This is like a projection of the relationship between the text also using like word frequencies maybe talk because it doesn't really uh doesn't really matter and it is colored by the labels by the genre labels from uh i believe um uh the either the british national library uh or uh or something else but it, uh, anyways this is like library labels here right and so you see that the texts organize themselves in groups they are not absolutely uh you know dispersed randomly um so different labels do correspond to do correspond to uh, different clusters, and this is you know this is useful to think about uh, what's happening there in terms of like like forces. What is the organizational uh, force here, right? Because here you see at this uh, you look at this text and they are colored in different uh, colored by genres. But I would you know I can bet uh, can can do risky bets that if you color it by uh, for example, chronology, by the time there will be also a dimension that will be represented uh, of time. So, so the text written in a similar similar time would be also grouped together. Because again, it is also confounded by genres, because some genres are more fashionable in some times than the others. And so the you know, different uh, interrelated, uh, uh, interrelated things start to pile up in these cases. So let's again play, uh, play a game uh, with you. Uh, this time, uh, you know about what about the representational power of the most uh, of, of the word frequencies. All right. So, first question: Can we tell using just the word frequencies? Can we tell apart uh, prose from poetry? Yes. Uh, more than that, we can absolutely tell about prose from poetry. In any scenario where you put poetry, especially metrical poetry, uh, with prose together, and you do some joint representation by word frequencies, this would be an absolutely different like lands, different continents, right? So here you see an example from ancient Greek. Uh, so the red points are prose, and the 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 blue points are. Um, and uh, the blue points are poetry, right? So, uh, in any scenario where the poetry is, is like breaking, is broken to lines, and especially if it's a, it's metrically organized meters do twist language syntax and all about the, the, about the natural language in so unpredictable and systematic ways that there's absolutely no, uh, no, uh, you know, uh, no way to establish like continuity between prose, uh, be between prose and poetry. Uh, what do you think, uh, uh, how do you think, uh, which features, why this happened, which features are more represented, which words are more represented in poetry, if you think about, uh, like, most frequent words? Huh? Uh, this is uh, yeah. This is a good direction. Uh, so much Heather, who is not with us, and and he's uh, one of the author of uh, the package that we'll be using, but he will be with us later today, so we'll have a chance to uh, to chat with him. Uh, so much Heather uh, found that the prepositions are actually um, uh, very very important here. Uh, so the prepositions um, uh, in poetry, their like their frequency is is very very high. But it's not only the prepositions; it's it's rather than the lack of conjunctions in poetry. Uh, right and conjunctions usually, you know, um, uh, thus, uh, therefore, and st stuff like that. They are related to analytical language, and in poetry, the syntax is twisted because there is a line breaks, and poetry is much more the language of the catalog. Right, it's much more about like uh, tying things together rather than making analytical statements with uh, with the conjunctions. So prepositions you use like five frequency of five preposition, it would be absolutely enough to separate one from another. Anyways, uh, I, I do poetry a lot in my in my computational studies, so this is my uh, this is my like pocket topic. So I like to talk about that. Anyways, uh, next question. Again, uh, very silly one. Uh, can we tell tell apart comedy from tra tragedy by the word frequencies? Well. Yes, yes, that, yeah, it's very, it's very simple. Here you have a, a example from Christoph Schoch, uh, which used topic models to separate uh, like classic uh, French uh, French drama. But even more than that, when I when I speak about uh, drama uh, and computational analysis or quantitative analysis of drama, I cannot not mention one of the pioneers, uh, pioneering uh, uh, works of uh, Boris Yerho, who did uh, uh, separation, basically the defining a feature space for uh, for drama. Uh, for Cornell drama and separating the the comedies, red points and blue points or tragedies. This is not the original plot of uh, Yerho. He did not have access to multidimensional uh, scaling, um, multidimensional project projection here. So I just used his data points into uh, to, uh, for uh, for visualization, and you see that they are uh, separated quite clearly. And there is a clitander. Uh, so if uh, some of you know this, the story of it, it's like a mixed genre, uh, a mixed genre. Uh, 
uh, text, which sits also like quite far from both of the clusters and kind of in the middle between them. Uh, okay, next question. Can we teleport? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so my question is about the approach to, you know, text analysis to be able to tell poetry from prose or comedy from tragedies. Is this still based on the back of words yes. system? So yeah. does it mean this is language agnostic? It would work for any language? Uh, it's still, uh, I mean, it's not tested for different languages, but you, you you would assume that if there is a social or like cultural convention, that it will be also reflected in in uh, um, yeah, in bag of words. And generally, bag of words like capture a lot of that like outside forces uh, that do organize the or organize the language. So in poetry, I would, uh, you know, I would again, uh, I would probably have like a risky bet again uh, that it would happen in 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 any language where the poetry is structurally opposed to prose. Yeah. So, so the, this this approach is going to be able to whatever pattern might be present for that specific cultural language, it will be able to identify that pattern at least. Is that right? Uh, well, that's yeah. an empirical yeah. question, right? So yeah. we can we can always look at okay. tested, yeah. yeah. Okay. But yeah. Uh, you know, the, I'm I'm just uh, reporting of what what we definitely know about about things. Uh, so, anyways, uh, next question: fiction from nonfiction. Uh, Yes, with an asterisk, right? Because we know that the styles of fiction and nonfiction writing diverged over time. So in nineteen uh, in in in, in uh, late eighteenth uh, uh, century, it would be much harder to tell about just stylistically prose, uh, uh, fiction prose from nonfiction prose, because well, fiction uh, prose was just settling in, uh, right? And it used a lot of like non nonfiction uh, nonfiction convention to uh, go apart. It you see here on the left side plot. You see the frequency. This uh, this change in language is connected to the so-called process of uh, fiction going into the direction of showing and not telling. So using much more con concrete lexis, uh, co concrete words. All right, this is a linguistic category: uh, uh, concrete versus uh, abstract words. Uh, while uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, while uh, uh, while the nonfiction um, staying at the uh, at the side of um, uh, at the side of uh, abstract words. Uh, so uh, again, there is, uh, you know, generally there are stylistic patterns. Uh, so again, um, the fiction is much uh, more descriptive and less analytical than, than nonfiction, as you could guess. And it diverged stylistically, uh, stylistically over time. So there's another, you know, compl uh, complication term uh, in, 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 the, in the whole thing, because the stylistic relationships should not be stable. They can, can change over time and be different over different time periods. Uh, Another question, can we teleport 19th century text from 18th century text? Again, yeah, the uh, very simple, uh, should be intuitive, uh, sh uh, should be intuitively uh, answered question because there is a language change. And so each new generation of authors adapt slightly different language and it's immediately immediately noticeable in, into the into the into their uh, choices, their linguistic choices. And it's obviously noticeable in the back of words approach to text, right? So. This is a plot uh, and network again. It describes just the similarities. So you saw different like visualizations now, uh, and all these visualizations they can be you know slightly different in fashion. They could be points on plots, and could be networks, could be trees. We will work a lot with trees, but they basically describe the same basic information: their relationships or similarities between uh, between sets of uh, word frequencies, right? Uh, so this is a plot uh, by Jan Rybitsky, the network that describes most strong relationship between texts, and you see not uh, you know not surprisingly that all the texts from 18th century tend to hang out together, all the texts from 19th century tend to come together, and so on and so on and so on. More than that. Not only centuries, but there's also a stylistic, often a stylistic drift in our our lifetimes. So this is the uh, this is the uh, Dickens novels that are uh, organized in kind of conventional um, uh, like periodization of uh, of his works, right? But you you see that the kind of the style drifts uh, and is more or less continues from 30s to uh, 30s that are green uh, on the plot to, to all towards the blue and purple on the right side. Uh, of the blog. Okay, uh, I think it's the last question. Uh, it's a tricky, tricky question. Can we tell apart uh, a text written by a woman and text written from men? And the, yes, that's one thing. And the, I, I need to, again, uh, to, to, to make a comment on that because we use, uh, and a lot of people who do computational gender analysis use binary gender representation just because historically we don't have 
uh, we don't have other uh, any other access to that. Uh, this is a major limitation. A lot of people are thinking or working of how to uh, overcome it by some uh, statistical approaches to uncertainty, for example, like data imputation. We can just say that we assume like 10% of the gender markers, for example, are wrong. But again, uh, so uh, in general, yes, we can tell apart the style uh, 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 the style of uh, men from women. But uh, so this is a plot from uh, Matthew Jokers, uh, his book, Macroanalysis. Uh, this is a blob of this is a network as well, where everything is connected to, to everything. But it's just like based on stylistic similarities by colored by the genre, uh, by the gender variable. Right. And so it, uh, it has a clear separation in green and purple into uh, women and men. However, there is studies, uh, there are several studies that show that this difference or recognizability of uh, the difference between uh, women uh, and men writing is going down, it's dropping uh, with the time. So this uh, is a study by Ted Underwood, uh, which shows that even like how characters of different gen genders are described in the novels, uh, it is. It starts like very, very distinct from one another, and then it becomes more similar to one another. And the answer uh, well, the answer lies in the roots of our kind of society, because uh, any kind of superficial, social, behavioral difference between uh, men and women is driven by the inequality between men and women in the society. The less inequality there is, the less the difference there is. And it's uh, correlated. I mean, it's not a, probably like a direct causal relationship, but it is strongly correlated. The stylistic difference is strongly correlated to uh, to the inequality ratings of the countries. Okay, now this is actually the last question. Can we tell apart Robert, uh, the writings of Robert Galbraith from the J.K. Rowling? No, the question is no, because this is the same person. The Robert Galbraith is, uh, 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 is a li uh, what is called? The liaison? Pseudonym. Pseudonym, yeah. The pseudonym of uh, J.K. Rowling, uh, Rowling uh, a detective. Uh, she published a book under, under, uh, under pseudonym um, in couple of years ago and it was was quite uh, fast like disclosed and then stylometrists came in and they said yeah there is like no uh, there's no difference the machine says this is the same person and this uh, returns us to kind of the the main domain of the stylometry the original domain the traditional historical domain of stylometry is authorship attribution but you see i talked about the authorship attribution in the very end of my slides because there is many many things happening uh, uh, outside the authorship signal and, and 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 kind of the traditional domain of the stylometry. So again, I return to the fact that the word frequencies are a curse uh, and a blessing, right? Because they simultaneously signal a lot of things, uh, starting from the uh, starting from the authorship. You're probably the most strongest signal that you will find in the text uh, uh, in the text because the basic assumption for a lot that a lot of stylometry started from is that uh you know text written by the same author would be um by any measure that you can derive would be much more similar to each other than to any third author uh that any any text of the third author um uh so um there there is a relationship that induced by the modes of writing or domains of writing so what i'm what i mean by that is like the, the st 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 big stylistical differences fiction and non-fiction pro prose and poetry um, um and different registers so a, a lot of uh, if you look at at, at the uh, literature on language variation and st in stylistics they talk about uh register uh, very much and the registers uh, the way we we uh, choose to talk more analytically or more descriptively they would reflect systematically also on like uh, the function words that we are using and this will be immediately uh caught up uh, by our uh like counting of the words uh especially if we have enough um enough data so obviously there's a uh, uh, influence of gender uh genre influence of chronology and all kinds of social uh other social conditions uh conditions of text productions like uh, socially constructed uh gender difference for example uh, okay, uh, now take let's take a uh, short breather. Uh, this is the first part of this first lecture. Uh, it's uh, kind of uh, hope it was uh, it was interesting. Uh, there's we talked a lot about you know the different forces that drive the text, and there is uh, one thing that I forgot to uh, to tell you is whenever you work with text, right, you need to be aware of the possible confounds, right? If you and there is no like proper way to prepare to that, right? If you're in interested in authorship like the genre signal would be a confounding signal. You would like to eliminate it or neutralize or uh, do something with that, right? 
in another direction, if you're working with genre, obviously you don't want your genre driven by the authorship, and there will be uh, situations where you know, um, the, like Agatha Christie is like one uh, one genre author, right? It will drive this genre representation. The authorship signal will drive genre representation quite um, quite importantly and quite significantly. So it's always like a task of the balancing of uh, uh, of your uh, research questions versus the corpus that you yeah, that you prepare for the analysis. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, did you receive, by the way, uh, did you receive the link to the uh, like HackMD document and there is some description of what to do? Any problems with that so far? Okay, uh, so don't worry. So we will switch to we will switch to R today. Uh, so we'll not work with Python. However, we will not do you know uh, we will not do the kind of the basics of R stuff like that. Basically, why we need R is just to run one function. So we'll get the uh, graphic user interface open and we'll click through the graphic user interface. Uh, we'll use the Stylo library, which is uh, I think a tremendous package for entry level package for. Uh, doing uh, more uh, text analysis and opens the door again to very complicated uh, and further uh, like multivariate text analysis in uh, general. However, if you don't have R or you don't want to install R or whatever, you know, there is a way to, uh, there is a, uh, in, in the Google fo uh, folder, there is a, there, the, there is a file, uh, the, the notebook, the Jupyter notebook uh, that is, um, not a Python notebook, it's an R notebook. So, so the, the call app also works with, with R. Uh, it can run R as well. Uh, however, uh, we will not go through that notebook with you on this class. So it's for those people who will have troubles running it locally. So if you really cannot run R or something like that, please take a look at that notebook. Um, it, uh, it will run the stylo, however, without the interface. Right. Uh, so because it's a call up, it's running on the, uh, some, some uh, on, on the Google, Google servers. Um, and it's a virtual machine. It will not render, uh, it will not render the graphical user interface. So you basically need to navigate the stylo manually. Okay. That's it. Uh, that's it from the comments. So we'll, uh, continue a little bit. So we'll continue. Okay. Good. Um, now let's get to the interesting part, uh, to uh, measuring the, um, you know, the way of the, the first the representation and the way of measuring similarities and differences between the texts. Again, this is, uh, this is, would be in a lecture, uh, in a lecture way, because I think this is important to like establish all the steps that we're doing before we jump into, uh, jump uh, uh, into the machine and let the machine handle things for us. So uh, I, I think like no conversation about telemetry can uh, uh, can avoid speaking about John Burroughs, who is a big uh, and prominent figure uh, in uh, in our field. And uh, John Burroughs is known for two things. First thing, in he's renowned by uh, as a as a person who cemented the use of most frequent words for representing the authorial style. Um, previously, uh, before John Burroughs, the authorship attribution was kind of an arms race with the author. Uh, people who did authorship attribution tried to uh, like find a feature or a couple of features that would like a, that would work as um, uh, as a fingerprint, right? That uh, would catch an author by the hand, will reveal something about their unique um, distribution or unique uh, unique fingerprint. Uh, these uh, kind of features could be the length of words, for example, uh, the length of sentences, uh, different ratios of uh, one thing to another thing. Uh, so what, what Burroughs did, as you see on this um, uh, uh, in this quote, that uh, he was talking about using simultaneously many things to uh, represent the style, and he he was saying that the stylistic distinctive uh, the the distinctive stylistic signature is usually made up of many tiny uh, strokes. And this is, was one of the main kind of conceptual contribution uh, to the field, the extending number of features that we are uh, using and allowing um, like the long uh, lists of features to uh, uh, talk uh, for themselves. You also see, uh, so the second thing for which Burroughs is prominent is for like designing a quite simplistic but very efficient way of 
measuring the similarities between two sets of most frequent words. Uh, it is called uh, the Burroughs Delta or Burroughs Delta Distance. The formula of that you can see on the screen. And don't worry about that. It's just there to scare you a bit. We will go through it and it's super simplistic. You will know uh, uh, it's just less math representation. If you don't, you know, uh, uh, if you don't uh, don't have a habit of reading like math formulas, any math formula would look like terrifying to you and it will still look terrifying to me as well. Um, uh, yeah, and one of also uh, the big contribution of Jeff Burroughs was this book uh, that was published before inventing the Burroughs Delta distance, uh, the computation into criticism um, about about Jane Austen. Uh, I think it's 1997. Uh, so in in this book, he shows he you basically uses uh, the most frequent words, the uh, the function words of character speech to 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 argue and infer different like social positions and in, in, in power uh, power dynamics between the characters in Jane uh, in Jane Austen just using the most frequent words and showing how much information social cultural uh, linguistic this these words convey. Uh, but this was the earlier part of his work. Uh, later, uh, he was known for uh, inventing or designing the Dalton. Uh, okay. So, so how do we go? What the, what is Dalton doing? Uh, so let's imagine that we have these two texts. They are not equal texts, but uh, they are written in some alien language. This alien language has only three words, right? Uh, the the uh, orange, the gray, and the red. Um, these are not equal. Uh, so how we go about, um, you know, measuring the difference between them, right? Uh, usually the, the difference or often the difference is represented by this, uh, uh, by this delta uh, sign. Um, uh, so we write like delta T1, T2. That's what also Burroughs had in mind when he named the method delta difference. So first thing, obviously, we do our traditional bag of words approach, right? We count each of the elements uh, separately. We count how many thing, uh, how many times a red words uh, appear in text one, how many, uh, how many times words appear in text two and so on, right? So uh, we count that we have two, now two sets of, uh, of frequencies, right? The frequencies that represent in text one and frequencies that do represent text two. Um, so obviously we can uh, now, we have the numeric representation of this text, right? We can write the T1 as 14, 6, and 10, and text two, we can write at 7, 21, uh, and two, right? These are, uh, these are the vectors. Again, these are ordered. So first position would always correspond to red. The second position would al always correspond to orange uh, or, or yellow, and the third to the gray. Okay, so, uh, you know, the most, um, one of the most intuitive things to go about uh, to to go about differences is like how do how, how do you measure like how do you measure the difference between them the 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 most basic operation that you can do between these two sets you know you have like five apples here and like two apples here what is the difference exactly yeah uh the, the the easiest thing to do would be subtract one from another right and we do it here as well uh, we do the subtraction uh and we see that the text one has over representation of feature red and and uh, or the word red and the word gray and text two has an absolute representation of uh uh of the word two right so now we have uh we have what we can call a vector of the differences something new emerged here right we have like three numbers that represent each of them represent the difference in each of this feature the difference on the red dimension the difference on the orange dimension and on the gray what is weird here what is weird in my like i don't know if how well sorry the screen is uh how well you can see it but uh i just wrote 6 15 and 10. what is weird about that Yeah, yeah, right, right. The the direction there should be a minus somewhere, right? Uh, if we just do the subtraction. However, we do subtraction in a way that doesn't care about the direction of the difference. We just care about the amount of difference. So we ignore all the minuses. We just like get all the difference, the information on how different is this thing between these two texts, right? Uh, well, all, I already spoiled it a bit, uh, but the, the other, so we still now have, and at this step, at least, we still have, you know, three numbers that represent the relationship between texts. So how to go, uh, you know, of deriving a distance measure in a way, uh, as some number that would describe the relationship between them. 
well, I spoiled it already. You just sum it up, right? You take all whatever you counted, the difference, and you like sum it up together. You get something here uh, was super bad as with basic math. So I did review this, uh, review the slides. And you see, and now this is one number. I just basically uh, scans all the difference from each of the feature. You can see it represented uh, with, the, with the squares. And now this number describes basically a sum of differences between each of the features. And this is, uh, congratulations, we just did uh, the Manhattan distance. This is the classic, uh, one of the classic measurements uh, in, um, in math, uh, the, the calculation of pairwise differences. Uh, the sum of the pairwise differences. That's it. We uh, uh, we will just we'll see in a minute why it's called Manhattan, and it also what basically borrows did as well. So uh, whenever uh, somebody speaks to you about delta, they also speak about the Manhattan uh, distance. The 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 biggest innovation of Burroughs was not in a distance itself. Burroughs was not a mathematician by training, so he also didn't know that he's re reinventing the Manhattan distance here. Um, the biggest invention uh, of Burroughs was how he treated features, how he scaled features, not in uh, the way of calculating distance. Because as you see, the calculation is super, uh, super easy. Uh, I mean, it's super simple. It's just the sum of the differences between each of the features, right? The, the, the difference in red word, difference in orange word, difference in gray word, sum together, that's it. Um, okay, so why it is called Manhattan? Uh, imagine I, this is an example, an amazing example that I like uh, to show all the time I teach this uh, from my friend and colleague, Peter Plechage. There is a link and slides will be available to you also. Uh, there's a link uh, if you want to check it out. Um, we had some indirect, I think the, the map doesn't work uh, anymore there uh, because whatever API access to Google Maps or something like that. But anyways, so imagine that you are in Manhattan, right? And you want to go from Chelsea Hotel, one point to uh, Empire State Building, another point. Uh, if you are, uh, you know, a human being in flesh uh, and not some transcendental entity, you will probably cannot do this, right? You cannot go in Manhattan through, uh, you know, uh, taking the, the shortest path. The shortest path is called the Euclidean distance, the, the way the bird would fly, right? And the shortest path between the two points, uh, and also it's called the Euclidean distance. What you will probably do, you will take the street, uh, you take the avenue, and then you you know, you uh, do the turn at some of the streets, right? And so to measure uh, the distance that you covered, you basically sum the, the distance that you covered on the street, on the avenue, and then you add to this the distance that you covered on the street, right? So it's a different way of navigating. And Manhattan distance assumes that everything is Manhattan. You cannot go into straight lines. You need to just like sum everything together, right? And if you, in the Empire State Building, if you take the elevator to the top of the Empire State Building, you'll add third dimensions, third dimension to that, right? Uh, so now we have three uh, kind of three dimensions that you covered to measure the distance that you covered. You sum them up together. Um, and now, of course, in uh, text analysis, there are much more words than two or three. We usually measure 50, 100, 1,000 words, 5,000 even in some cases when we're dealing with large text like, like, uh, like novels, right? So uh, yeah, people who do text analysis and LP like to, to think and like to speak about them as dimensions as well. So you'll have a representation that has 5,000 dimensions. Uh, probably it's a bit hard to imagine like navigation in 5,000 dim dimensions, right? After everything after three is basically a bit challenging for our three-dimensional brain that kind of is super wired to, mm -hmm. to, 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 perce to, uh, to perceive three dimensions. But for math, like it's the same summing of the differences. If I had on this example, if I had four, uh, colors here, you know, you will have a four dimension. You will just have just add another term to that. It's not a problem. Uh, in math, math can handle all kinds of operations with absolutely crazy spaces. And you know, don't even start me on the topology. My friend is the topologist, and he is like that. This is actually, this is actually a cup or something like that. You know, they are they are crazy people. Um, uh, so, anyways, so. Uh, just to keep in mind that we're st still, you know, we're still not in Manhattan. We're still speaking about uh, about the word frequency. So imagine that, you know, the dimension of the avenue is the dimension of the V, right? For example, and the dimension of the off is the dimension, uh, dimension of the street is the dimension of the off, right? So this is two-dimensional representation. And we can put however we, however many English text we want into that, right? Um, 
uh, they they would be uh, spread differently across across this map, and we can measure the um, measure the distance between uh, each uh, between the, each of the pairs. Uh, so uh, you know, in two dimensions, it's quite easy. We still can can imagine it as a point into uh, into the two dimensional space. In three dimensions, we still can imagine it as a point in the three dimensional space. But if we add more, it's uh, it makes it makes it a bit challenging. But again, the operations the operations are uh, uh, um, staying the same. We're just pretending that we are in this weird multidimensional Manhattan where there's like many ways to go when you go high uh, to the Empire State Building and then you go left to some other dimension and you know and you pile up and pile up, uh, pile up uh, and you know there is no no real complication for math of handling that and there is many many ways to to calculate a, 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 a distance between between things between numerical vectors uh, the word embeddings, for example, uh, people who do work with uh, with word embeddings, uh, they are very like to use or the one of the staple kind of distance is the cosine distance. Uh, that is like the perspectival distance. That so you imagine that you're standing somewhere, somewhere far away from a Manhattan, like on the state statue of Liberty Island, and you're like looking at something, right? And so the the distance between the two things would be the angle in your projected view uh of view vectors so the uh, the interesting thing about uh the the, the it's kind of a perspective of the uh distance the interesting thing that cosine kind of doesn't care about the length of the vector so the the distance between these two objects on manhattan would be calculated as if it was the same distance if they're also were closed uh were also close to you but it's not not that important the good thing uh, you know, there's a lot of talk in telemetry about different distances and uh, testing and evaluating different distances of measurement. Uh, a lot of research says that actually, you know, you can you you, you can not you know uh, think about that too much, uh, because it's not really the distance choice that matters. It matters the like uh, the scaling of the features and preparation of the features matters the most. So I just tell I'm just showing you that there could be many many ways of navigating the space. Some of them are more efficient, some of them are less. But Burroughs Delta is a safe enough entry choice uh, for uh, for doing that. Uh, so this is like the more uh, mathy uh, representation of uh, math rep uh, representation of uh, of the distance measurements here. Um, uh, you see, we have this, the same thing. The Euclidean distance is the straight line between two points. The Manhattan distance is as if we are going through some uh, some imaginary uh, Manhattan. So we only like we can only uh, navigate um, uh, by uh, summing up the distances in each uh, dimension separately. And the cosine distance is like an angle between some like imagined projection vectors. Don't think about that too much. Um, so the biggest invention that Burroughs did, I mentioned that, was not in the distance itself because it existed, everybody knew it, but mathematicians looked at Burroughs, uh, mathematicians looked at Burroughs, uh, uh, at Burroughs data. Uh, they're like, okay, this is, uh, this is Manhattan. Uh, this is nothing new. Uh, however, the, the invention was in uh, other direction, right? Because you think, so I was, I, I was showing you basically like the absolute values, right? It's the summing up of absolute values. So all, all we represent each, uh, um, each word, we count each word, we derive some absolute number like 10, like 10 times, right? Uh, the problem with that is I already mentioned there would be uh, there would be uh, inequality, huge inequality, the word in the word frequency distribution. There would be super small amount of words. All of them are, are function words, the syntactic and grammatical glue that you cannot, you know, you cannot like step, a, 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 have a step in the world of language without like contaminating it with all kinds of uh, function words. All right. So the function words would be most frequent and they will be so uh, unequally frequent to all other uh, words that we counted that they basically, if you just sum the differences between them, all the differences would be driven by the most frequent words. You see, this is the the plot on the top. So the plot on the top shows the relative distance, basically the same thing. So we uh, we uh, calculate the relative, uh, rel not the relative distance, but the rel relative frequency. We'll calculate uh, the frequency of a word relative to the to the all words of uh, in this text, right? So we derive like a percentage. Basically, we say word V is about four uh, percent. You know, uh, uh, of, uh, frequency of the word V is four percent of all the words that are used there. And you see that uh, this uh, this plot has like the steep curve, has a long tail. It is a problem because in all our calculations, all the most frequent words will be driven 
would be driving what we uh, know about this world. We, we don't uh, we don't give any um, like uh, any options to speak for other features to also speak up. Uh, and so what Burroughs proposed is not to using so to to uh, kind of avoid this kind of problem with uh, uh, with a long tail of words that are less frequent and giving all the kind of all the power to most frequent words. He said, well, first we do the normalization, so-called the z-scaling. What the z-scaling means is basically we don't take the frequency of a word itself, but we look at how this word appears relative to the corpus average. We have like a corpus, several documents into the corpus, right? We look at the word frequency, and then we look at how different this frequency is from the average, and it's expressed also in standard deviations. But you see the second plot, so it's the plot on the top now uh, is uh, recording basically the difference in uh, from the mean, basically a difference of this frequency from the mean. And you see that now all the differences are in much more comparable spaces. They're not like there is no one or two features that are super overrepresented. Of course, there are features that are much more different from the mean, and this is exactly what we uh, uh, this is exactly what we want. What do you think is the problem here? Like what is the the crucial kind of operation here that this standardization does by introducing the mean? Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you can calculate the z score with one as well, but this would be like the mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, my question was um, whether the corpus average then meant a corpus of multiple books. Yes, of and course. The answer yeah. Is yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so here, this is example from uh, from uh, uh, the paper by Stephanie uh, Evert and everyone uh, else. Uh, so they uh, this is an example with two books here, uh, Jane Eyre and Shirley. Uh, but uh, obviously, this operation only makes sense when you have a collection of more than one text, more than one document. But what is what is the crucial about introducing this notion of the mean? What do you think? Before that, we didn't care about the mean, right? We just counted things. And we count, when we count things like that, they will always tell the same, doesn't matter like what happened. If we add third text, we'll still counts still stay, stay the same, right? This uh, uh, absolute counts. Sorry? So if we, um, you asked the uh, question about what's the, significance of the mean i think yeah. we'd be more focused in terms of like basically um removing the repetitions and just keeping um the most important words that we want to analyze is yeah right I mean, this is uh this is obviously true yeah this is the goal kind of the main the main function of doing this uh looking at how each word or how each feature is different from its mean yeah. usage in the corpus uh, but introduction of the mean, what it does, it makes it context dependent. And this is crucial here, right? Because we introduce, if we just count the words and we introduce the fourth text here, uh, nothing will happen with counts. But if we use, um, uh, if, uh, if we use the, the Z scaling that we are comparing, uh, comparing the word usage to the mean usage of the corpus, if we introduce a new text, for example, into our calculation, the mean will change. So all calculations will shift slightly. And if we introduce a significant part of a uh, significant amount of texts like documents uh, compared to our original corpus, the mean will change even more dramatically and all the relationship would be rearranged. All, all our calculations would be rearranged. So a lot of telemetric operations um, essentially depend on the context. You will see that throughout this course uh, today. Uh, and it's a very important thing to keep in mind that uh, your corp corpus design would play a significant role uh, in the results and the output that you are getting, right? So for example, if you, you know, uh, uh, if you take like the J.K. Rowling novels and Shakespeare novels, right? And then you add like Marlowe to that um, and you say, oh, Marlowe is much, much more similar to Shakespeare. Probably Marlowe is a Shakespeare, right? No, because, you know, it depends on the context. You define your corpus in a way that this huge variation between like uh, early modern English and modern, um, uh, and modern, um, 
and modern fiction. So obviously there would be one corner of the texts that would be modern fiction and one corner of text would be early modern uh, fiction. And this relationship would be rearranged if you remove, for example, one part of this corpus or another part of this corpus. Okay, sorry, that's what's uh, a, a bit more uh, a bit more challenging. So, but but returning to to the funny things now. Um, okay, so uh, uh, again, if we just measure the calculate the difference between the two texts, it doesn't really tell us much that much, right? So here, for example, we have like text two and uh, text one and text two. We say okay that the Manhattan distance, the absolute uh, in the absolute frequencies is like thirty, but like what does it tell us? Um, there is no real context again, context dependency. There is no real context for us to lean back and say, is it, it is the huge difference? Is it the small difference? Is it like expected difference or like what, what is it telling us? So usually, uh, in, um, in stylometry, you know, the minimal context, uh, that you need for, you know, kind of similar relationships start to emerge is obviously a tree text, something third to compare the pairwise relationship. And usually we, uh, uh, we do what will uh, uh, what you will have when you are doing stylometry is you measure uh, distances between a lot of the text simultaneously, right? So you have corpus of fifteen novels. You will need to um, measure pairwise distances fifty, uh, or not fifty, much more than fifty times, right? You will need to measure the pairwise distances between each of the pairs, uh, right? So you see here. Usually we record these pairwise distances in a form of a matrix of a so-called distance matrix. This distance matrix is square matrix, so it says has the same number of rows and the same number of columns, and it is also symmetrical across the diagonal because it, you know, kind of describes the relationships uh, twice. And the diagonal would be zeros. Why? Yeah, because the 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 distance from yourself to yourself, at least physically, is zero. You know, we're not speaking of metaphorical journeys that could be very long uh, journeys to yourself, but usually, you know, the the same place. It's the same text, so it has the same numbers. If you extract the same thing, you'll get zeros. Um, but uh, so you use the distance matrix to record and hold information about the relationships. And if there's not too many texts, you can just you know open the distance matrix and look at that and argue something about that. So for example, here you see that um, text one and text two are much closer to uh, each other, right? Uh, they have distance of zero three. So the smaller the distance, uh, kind of the more similar they are. Uh, then they are both to text uh, uh, to text three, for example, right? So, uh, but however, if you add more texts uh, to this distance matrix, the number of connections it uh, increases dramatically. Uh, it's it is impossible to uh, just read and infer some meaningful information from this kind of uh, data. So people devised all kinds of things and kind of methods that take this matrix and try to make sense out of this, right? So uh, what we will encounter and some of the things that you are already encountered, um, there will be a hierarchical clustering that uh, clusters the similar points together and then aggregates, um, you know, other similarities, uh, 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 other similarities. There will be all kinds of like two-dimensional projections that also basically work on the distance matrix. So the distance matrix is the heart of all the operation that you are doing. And, um, you know, all other representational techniques or analysis techniques, they is just uh, a way to try to make sense of the dis distance matrix. You also saw in my presentation already like different like two dimensional plots where you basically see the, the points. So this, these are all kinds of projections or dimensionality reduction techniques uh, that will also do a little bit. You'll also saw graphs. So you can also represent the same similarity information in, in a way of constructing a network. Right, so you record the most uh, the, the most prominent connections, the most pro prominent neighbors uh, together. Then you assign some scores to that, and then you go uh, go with it. But again, you have different ways of representing, but the underlying information will be always the same, and it's important to keep in mind. Right, it will be a distance matrix that holds all pairwise connections between the texts. Um, I like to, uh, to, uh, to mention here a, a quote from Cavalli Sforza, who was a gen geneticist, but it's a very important thing to understand, uh, to understand, uh, the tree uh, generally, right? The clustering, any clustering technique, basically, uh, uh, he wrote that a tree, any tree can be viewed as a simplified description of a matrix of a distances. He was speaking about the distances, genetic distances between the species, uh, evolutionary distances. And again, the tree is just a simplification. In our case, 
all of these plots that you nice plots that you see the the the, the trees uh, the uh, two dimensional projections or graphs there's also a simplification of this very very uh, dense network of relationship and again I refer back to the school to, to the name of this course right the mining uh, the extracting knowledge from texts and in this here we learn much more not from the text themselves but from the relationships between the texts right and so these are different ways of doing this to of representing the relationships uh okay so to uh wrap things up uh you always already have the uh all the ingredients for multivariate text analysis and stellometry as a subfield of that but uh it will open a lot of doors of general of doing like general uh general textual analysis and, and textual representations so first what you need for this kind of analysis is is the feature space right designing your own uh space it could be words it could be some other features it could be uh, some narrative features that you found a way to measure uh, and extract from texts but this is the first thing where that these texts all these texts like uh sit right where where are they sitting uh, we don't have much choice in terms of these columns, right? Because this column sits in the, our, our boring three-dimensional world and uh, it's hard to change. I mean, we, we can change its, its dimension, but it's hard to represent this column like in, in 15 dimensions. Uh, maybe there is a world somewhere there uh, where we can do that, but not here, right? And here we have a lot of uh, a lot of creational power because we can define the space. Do we want this text to be represented by uh, the words connected only to the sea, for example? This could possibly do. We'll, 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 we can all select like several features that are connected to the sea, like ship, uh, water, captain, or something like that. And then we say this is this is our space. This is what we are interested in. And so we'll see how the text sit in the space. Or we can construct a space that is much more vast than that. We can use one thousand words, uh, most frequent words that includes both the frequent words and the content words and some verbs and you know uh, things like that. So when you have the feature space you want a way to navigate the space right so you, you define this one you populate this with text and then you want to understand where this text sit uh um uh, in uh, uh you know in relation to each other right and so again uh, we uh, try to estimate how different or how distant they are and in our case again our text is still is each text in the space is represented by some counted things we counted something uh, that is shared or maybe not shared uh, across all other texts, but we definitely use this representation to put all the text, uh, all the text there. And uh, kind of the step three uh, in this unsupervised analysis, at least if you are just interested in uh, in clustering, in exploratory analysis, that would be the mapping of uh, relationships. So we have already talked about different ways to do that, construct trees, projections, and networks. But don't forget that this is a direct outcome of the recorded uh, pairwise distances between the texts in some uh, uh, feature space of our creation of our design. So uh, good news is that Stylo uh, does that in R uh, for you. Uh, you can uh, probably, you know, at some, uh, uh, I hope at least that in, at some point, uh, you will also have an urge to do that in Python. And uh, Javier, as he started to show like NumPy uh, manipulations with vectors yes, uh, yesterday. So if you know how to, you know, vectorize your uh, uh, your text, it's basically giving you a basic build building blocks of all the things that come uh, comes next. But we will not do the manual vectorization in, in R today. We will just show you um, a library that does that for you. But keep in mind all the steps that it's doing, uh, it's doing before. Um, any questions before I get uh, get to show you my unhinged meme collection? <laughs> Thank you. Looking forward to that. Um, I had a question, but I don't know if I'm jumping uh, over stuff we'll, that will be discussed later. Yeah. And it has to do with the creation of the corpora or the corpus. Yes. And it has to do with gender signal and gender like sorry genre uh yeah. signal and yeah. so on first um i have the impression that most of the stuff we've been talking about except poetry a, a little bit is like novels and it's english and i'm i'm, I'm thinking about myself and latin yeah. and how that takes a lot of uh and i don't know if this is the right term like lemmatization or normalization mm -hmm. of uh, orthographic variants and so yeah, on. yeah how do we go about that and also 
I don't know if this is something that we will discuss later, but what can you say about comparing texts from different genres in order to look for a potential author attribution? But again, just I think I'm jumping over too many things. So. This is uh, this is a great question. We can uh, yeah, we can use uh, two sessions to to, to answer that. But uh, generally. Uh, there are a few things that that are kind of this traditional. What we are showing you is like a traditional stylometry that kind of is data hungry. So all the word frequencies approach are data hungry. You need like a large, larger text representation. Doesn't really matter what languages. There is a good enough evidence that uh, the signals is there in many languages. Lemmatization uh, can be an important thing. Um, however, there is a trick. Uh, if you are specifically interested in in you know, authorship signal, not like in content, in signal from content words, uh, or, or like different semantic uh, uh, semantically related words, uh, uh, there is a trick for highly inflected languages. Uh, is instead of counting the words, we count the character engrams, so the sequences of characters. This allows us access both to the content and to grammatic and morphological variation. Uh, because we, yeah, we basically we don't don't do the morphological analysis, but because we we split the text in the, in the character sequences, we we get the signal from the endings, uh, from the suffixes and prefixes, and and the stems of the words as well. So it is very powerful. It out, outperforms word uh, word uh, uh, for Latin definitely because uh, I uh, our colleague Ben Najid did that for Latin poetry, and he used character character engrams uh, with quite success. It is also makes you your approach less data hungry. So there is more uh, character engrams in a given text than the words, uh, right? So you you can can kind of cheat and derive a little bit more information from that. So, but uh, the question is great, and will I hope will answer or uh, will tackle some of this uh, some of the parts of this question in, during the course, right? Yeah, we'll definitely have time for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we do have still like 15 minutes i think we we need to, sp to spend that time like making sure that that everything runs uh for all of you so this is the this is the time to you know check uh check your engines check the r um and yeah i know if you want to to lead everyone through like basic stylo uh operations uh any installations and stuff yeah okay. sure we can, okay we can do that um if you guys are ready ah sorry um, can you hear me now great um do you feel ready to jump into doing stuff or any more questions at this point um okay happy to hear that very happy um yeah so um today's uh in general we will uh today in general we will uh we will be covering quite a few things and we want you to experiment we want you to play around and uh, ask a lot of questions oh yeah uh so my name is jan nabyshuk uh, i thought artyom already introduced me but if not uh my name is jan nabyshuk i also work with artyom at the institute of polish language the polish academy of sciences hello, uh, Tie Pablo. um hello uh yeah so uh, i um uh, i'm just finishing my phd that's dedicated to stylometry in application to audiovisual work so i also analyze uh image and sound with stylometry um but i've been doing this for text for the last almost seven years uh so so it's been quite a while and um yeah and i will be helping you to run things and experiment and basically go wild like we are here to, here to do things break things and uh think about your data and what you can do with this um so uh first of all um i would like to ask you um how many of you have installed our or our studio successfully like please raise your hand up so I can see um, be easier to be okay who hasn't managed like um, don't worry about this it happens like there are various problems okay so um yeah some problems what operating system are you using okay Mac Artyom will you help yes uh, yeah thank you um so don't worry about this it happens all the time like uh, this is the regular uh thing when we teach stylo everybody is having problems with installations or something running um who has also managed to install stylo or who hasn't managed to install stylo a better question okay one two three four five six okay um so 
Um, so we will maybe handle this before we proceed much further, because um, I think it will be good to be on the same ground. Uh, in the meantime, have any of you tried experimenting with Stylo? Like, did you just install it or did you try to launch it and see what it's doing? Um, and so on. And uh, another question, how many of you have some data set that you want to experiment with your own stuff? Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah. So um, so we will be using the uh, simple collection of, uh, of English novels, just 27 of them that uh, for the demonstrations. And this is already shared in the uh, in the video. If some of you are prob having problems installing Stylog, please alert uh, Artyom so he can catch you. Um, and uh, for your own data sets, um, um, there are a couple of rules, as you already asked about how to design your corpus. Um, this is a very good question, and we will talk about it um, a little bit more today for a couple of times. Um, and there are um, a number of things to consider. Um, you can, of course, just rely on the simple English data set that we've said. Um, this is the data set that we've uh, test proved a lot of times. So uh, so pretty much it's, it's impossible to break it, uh, and um, or at least you have to try very hard to break it. Um, I won't say it's impossible because there are no impossible things with coding, right? Um, but when it comes to... Um, when it comes to your own data sets, if you're using languages other than English, uh, there will be a few things to consider, but we're absolutely encouraging you to try to do this, whether now in the class or if you want to um, spend some time later in the evening or tomorrow, we will be here also the whole day tomorrow. So feel free to just approach us and ask us questions about that. And um, we'll be happy to, to talk to you. Um, so um yeah i'm thinking just like uh how far do we want to go now uh so that um so that we don't uh lose you those of you who don't have uh, the installations ready um, so maybe i will just briefly talk about corpus design in the meantime okay and um uh, so that when we start clicking things everybody's on the same page so if you have problems with installations just alert us during the break as well and uh, and we'll make sure that uh, that you know stuff um okay just a second uh, let me share my stuff and yeah and uh, thank you on the chat. I see that people are also installing Stylo. So yeah, please use the HackMD link. And let me share the screen now. Fun, fun, fun. Um, so when it comes to the question in the chat, how Stylo is installed, it should also be covered in the HackMD if you go to the one of the first links, but let me show you. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, so also for those of you who are still struggling, uh, in general, um, like when I was starting to learn Stylo, I found uh, just using R console easier, but for many of you using R studio might be easier because it's a little bit, uh, more stable and it will also give you the visuals of, uh, of the graphs in one window and so on. So, um, um, you might also want to consider this. It usually also has fewer installation problems, but no guarantees. And also no guarantees about the internet, uh, apparently. Um, but yeah, about installing R and R Studio, if you want to install the Stylo, just go to the step-by-step -step introduction. And this is in general something that will become your best friend um, during the next, uh, during this day. Um, so this is a very small, a very simple um, walkthrough that we've created a couple of years ago. You have all of the commands here with descriptions and you will find that in general using Stylo is pretty easy, but as you proceed, there will be different things that you want to add, you want to experiment. So for installing, once you run your R or your R Studio, you just type install packages style like this. And then it usually asks you to uh, pick your R server. It really doesn't matter which one you choose. Although in general, I would say prefer to choose one that's geographically closer to you. Like maybe not necessarily while we here in Spain, select Japan or Australia. It might be a bit slower then. And um, to those of you who've already uh, installed R or R Studio, um, I'm doing the crazy font, but I hope that you will be able to see also in the back rows um, some some stuff that I'm typing here. So 
basically, if we want to install it still, we would we would go with install packages. And one nice thing about our studio is that it will always try to help you. So it will always give you the command that you're looking for, and you can immediately spot if you're making a typo. Um, and this this construction install packages plus uh, round brackets. This is how our calls functions, uh, and you might remember functions from yesterday. Function is like a small program packed into one command that will make it easier for you to do something. Um, so in this case, this is the function for installing things. And if you want to install Stylo, you just put Stylo inside uh, in the quotation marks. But there is plenty of uh, there are plenty of other very interesting libraries for R that will be helpful with NLP and that are very well documented um, and you can install them just the same. Uh, I won't be clicking on this because um, I already have Stylo installed, but um, just so that you know, this is how you do it. I hope that, uh, that this is working. And uh, once it's installed, uh, it's also very important that uh, you always need to call your library. So I haven't done this yet, but uh, sorry, I cannot hear you. Um, yes, yeah, so once you have the, the library installed, and the library is again like a collection of functions that we install locally on our computer, and uh, every time we open R or our studio and so on, we need to tell our computer to use this library uh, so that it knows that it needs to load it. Because um, if you're a programmer or if you're just... Um, Mm, uh, using a lot of different uh, programs, you will have a lot of them installed and they will slow down your, your computer. So you don't want to uh, have everything loaded all the time. So you just select that, okay, now I'm using Stylo. R, please launch Stylo for me. And we do this by just uh, writing, typing libra library and Stylo in the brackets. And if it's properly installed, now you should get some sort of communicate um, that will say the which style of version you're having. So this is the command that was important for you. Library and in the brackets, run brackets, style. Uh, and if it's giving you this greeting message like, hello, this is style of version 074 or maybe 084 or maybe 05.2, you might have installed it in the past. You might have a newer version than I am. Um, and you have this uh, proposal of citation, it means that everything is properly installed, it's properly loaded. Do you see that? <laughs> okay. Um, yes, yeah, so in case of any problems, like we will be doing this on the rotation. So one of us is speaking, the other one. Um, that was just because I was checking this, but yeah, we will talk about no, no, you don't need the path for now. I will explain how to set your working directory paths in a second. Uh, it's actually a bit simpler uh, in, uh, it's potentially a bit simpler in R than in Python. So I know that many of you were uh, were a bit scared of this yesterday, that uh, finding your path, selecting it, it can be challenging. Um, but um, R actually has, um, again, a couple of ways to make it easier for you. Uh, so don't worry about this for now. We will set our working directory uh, after the break. For now, just make sure that you have it installed and it gives you this greeting message. And if it's not happening for you, please let us know so that we can help you uh, fix this. And after break, everything is fine. Um, okay, so this is our studio and uh, we will come back to loading the data in a second. Yeah, in the meantime, let me just check if there are any issues on on uh, chat. I think people are coping, that's great. If there are... Uh, yeah, don't care about choosing an R server, uh, just select randomly. Um, this is my answer to the chat question. Um, once you once you select install.packages and stylo, um, you will have a new window open and it will give you uh, a list of servers that you can choose from. Um, this is how it, uh, so the command is install packages.stylo, uh, sorry, stylo in brackets, like we looked at a while ago. Maybe I will just copy this so that uh, so that everybody has it uh, in case it's lost in the materials. This is the command. Yeah, I the server. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, of course. Like you can always, like every single time you're running it, it will ask you to select the server. So you can even install 100 style, uh, 100 R libraries, assuming you have a drive space and use a different server every time. There is plenty of them. And um, in general, you shouldn't have problems with any of them working, but, uh, but it will help once you, once you do, uh, once you are closer. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, yeah, what, what else? Um, if it's not giving you an option of picking a server, it's probably doing this automatically. So, um, sorry, I cannot really help with this remotely. Um, but, uh, but sometimes it just automatically picks whatever is the fastest. And as long as, uh, as it's loading, it should be fine. Um, Okay, uh, maybe we will come back to the chat questions in a second, because um, to be honest, I'm I'm not sure about all of them. There are some R Studio questions, so um, Artem is more experienced with R Studio, uh, so maybe he will be more helpful with this. Can I uh, just did you talk about X squares? Oh uh, no. Uh, just note for Mac users, um, there were some questions about error that uh, Stylo throws the X quartz error. It's absolutely normal. Don't worry about that. You just need to Google the X quartz. It's like additional package on your system that you need to install uh, outside our studio, right? It's just like you Google it and and should work. Yes. Mm. Ah, okay. Sorry, I need to 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 handle another thing. Yeah, actually, um, actually, with uh, X quartz, you also have on the um, Stylo. Uh, our GitHub, you have uh, the way to solve it. Um, so. This is something that's well known to us. Uh, it happens to all Mac users. Don't worry about this. And basically, yeah, there is, um, yeah, there is a whole description here. Um, oh, sorry, oh, too many windows. Um, so I will maybe just, uh, but if you just Google, um, sorry, the, um, yeah, I have too many windows open. <laughs> yeah, um, but if we just go to, not title uh just a second so let me make it a header yeah um in general um a lot of these issues are described on the on the github page so uh if you just google stylo plus github it will give you the main page and uh there you have the uh, exports described um in detail like yeah Seriously, it happens to all the Mac users, so don't worry, it's it's fixable uh, quite easily. Um, and I'm actually thinking, since there are three minutes till, till break, perhaps we, we start a break and no, fix but... the issues in the meantime. And once we come back from, from the break, we will talk about corpus design and, uh, and start running things. So if you have everything installed, everything is working, you have the data set downloaded as well, then you're totally free. If you have some issues, just alert us and we'll help you fix them. <laughs> 